Then we start. Distinguished colleagues, dear friends, today we carry out our traditional Tuma board, and today it is organized with our good friends, bosom friends, leading experts in oncology, and this is Alexander Kutikov and Richard Greenberg, our global experts for today, and who are the best representatives of oncology and the ones who are working in Fox Chase, Chains Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And let me remind you that our tumor board is supported by the American Asian Alliance on Oncology with the support of Oncology Center named after Blahin and carried out by the Russian Society of Oncologists. Today, simultaneous translation is available. So please keep it in mind during the presentation so simultaneous translation is available and also in chat you can provide your questions comments remarks this tumor board is to be recorded and later on you can find the recording and the website of the russian association of oncologists because there is very big time difference in different time zones of russian federation the country is very large even now not all the regions can physically be with us that is why this recording will be available for some time at the website so, with that, we are happy to start. I'm welcoming our friends and guests, Professor Greenberg and Professor Kutikov. And uh, hopefully we will start with the presentation of our case. And this is our leading fellow about penile cancers. And we will show the cases, then we will discuss the cases. Actually, we can present both and then to discuss. So it's up to you, uh, our experts. So, Dr. Halamurzaev, the first case, please. Please share your screen. Please proceed. So, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Today, we want to present successful case of patient treatment with stage four of penile cancer. And I would like to discuss the opportunities of drug treatment and the efficacy of palliative cytoreductive surgery to avoid fatal complications like erosive bleeding and severe infections. So case one, patient aged 44. This is penile cancer. This is penile cancer, HPV associated cancer, metastasis in inguinal and pelvic lymph nodes on the right. The complication here is the necrosis of the right inguinal lymph nodes, infected cutaneous fistula. Patient referred to the complaints in the pural and discharge. On the right, limitation of the right uh, leg, range of motion, pain syndrome, fever 39 centigrade. As you can appreciate from here, in the local examination. Here you see the tumor of the glands of the penis, three by two centimeter. Actually, it takes uh, half semi surface with episodes of bleedings from the glands. And also you can see tumor massive of conglomerate pelvic lymph nodes, size seven by six, groin masses. Patient had daily sanation bandages, removing infected necrotic masses on the right. Blood test, high leukocytes because of, from infected metastasis, we could find gram-negative culture. Patient could just uh, 
had limited self-care, mainly bedridden due to strong pain syndrome and huge conglomerate in the uh, right groin. So circumcision is uh, indicated amputation plus near adjuvant, but high titer of hep C. And this uh, high titer of hep C changed our tactics of management. Here on the slide, you can appreciate uh, the data of PET-CT. This is conglomerate of uh, inguinal lymph nodes with high uptake, also iliac and femoral lymph nodes that are uptaking. Patients started antiviral treatment, rebaverine 800 milligram per os daily, interferon alpha 3 million daily, then uh, three times a week for another 20 weeks. Serum HCV RNA was measured before, during, and at week 24, after the end of uh, antiviral treatment. So we reported dramatic effect, dramatic reduction of hep C RNA. And then patient had two courses of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, carboplatinum day one, and then paclitaxel day one, day eight, then 15. With that, we had complete response of the primary tumor. We got very good response on the glands, no tumor on the glands. Lymph nodes reduced from 1.5 up to one centimeter. As primary tumor was not identified on the glands after the drug treatment, so we made decision to change the volume of surgery and to perform circumcision, bilateral, inguinal, ileic, and femoral lymphadenectomy. And later on, patient got adjuvant chemotherapy with the same scheme, with the same doses. The last cycle of chemo was carried out in April 2017. If you appreciate this picture, you can see that on the glands, we could identify up to three centimeters tumor, tumor disappeared, and this is complete response to treatment. And five years of follow-up here in the inguinal, in the primary, no data for relapse and continuous growth. So this year, patient had PET CT, and according to that, there is no data for progression. The only thing we would like to draw your attention to is that left groin area, that's the site where there was no injury. So there is a little bit of accumulation of scar in tissue. Scar absorbs radiopharmaceutical. with the size seven by 10 millimeters, also multiple cytologists, and um, the results do not confirm any data for tumor, no tumor. So five years since the onset of treatment, patient is alive, no relapse, no progression, employed, sexual activity returned, recovered, no functional disordered, Fa patient is uh, precisely followed up histologically. We got the results. This is squamous cell, squamous cell cancer from 45 lymph nodes removed in 12. We saw metastasis of squamous cell cancer with a uh, grade three, four pathomorphosis. So that was the first case. Hello, uh, this discuss the first case or uh, shall we move on to the second one and discuss two cases? Uh, Richard, what do you think? Well, I think uh, you're not gonna get any better than the first case. So let's go on to the one that didn't work so good. Okay, so... Uh, uh, I just yeah. got, yeah, I mean, I think just, I just have a couple of questions. Um, why carboplatin instead of cisplatin in this case? Да, у него почки были там. 
повреждены нет, или нет. Мы, а, было принято решение... Why carbon not cis? Kidney problem? Well, we made a decision that it could bring some additional hepatotoxicity, and we were afraid of viral infection. So that's why the decision was made to administer carboplatinum with paclitaxel. And cyclophosphamide, the same, the same reasoning, right? Yes, because of that. Yes, because of that. Well, I never saw it in my life, you know, that everything is gone. Yeah, complete response. Complete response. And the patient uh, uh, could preserve the glands. And actually, the initial tactics once recommended glansectomy, partial or complete amputation, but uh, with chemo immunotherapy, we got complete response, CR, CR, with very good, with very good outcome. But immunotherapy was against hep C, right, immunotherapy against hep C, definitely, it's not anti-tumor. And also we see positive dynamics, we reduce viral load, hep C viral load, very interesting. Very interesting. Let's move to the second case. Maybe we can discuss both later. Second case, patient aged 40, administered in a critical, critical situation with a diagnosis of penile cancer, clinical stage T3 and 3M2, multiple metastasis, inguinal, pelvic, lungs, three lesions up to one centimeter, tumor masses, also thrombus, then in the femoral vein, then going to the external and iliac vein. Uh, complications, as you can see here, multiple episodes of bleeds in the massive of uh, inguinal lymph nodes that was life-threatening anemia and septic shock. The source of that was the infected mass. The whole inguinal area was taken by this conglomerate of pelvic uh, lymph nodes, groin lymph nodes, with invasion into skin, scrotum, penis, and we also palpated in the left inguinal multiple lymph nodes up to three centimeters. Patient uh, was administered in hypertension with hemoglobin four and very high leukocytes. We also had uh, multiple meta metabolic disorders in this case. So patient could not self-care at all. Bad reading, completely bad reading. With high anesthesiology risk, we made this surgery. Well, according to CT data, we can identify the mass, metastatic mass into the external iliac and internal iliac vessels and also you see big mass of the tumor on the right groin and in the left groin, smaller one. Also here you see the uh, femoral vein invasion and uh, penile skin. In the coronary slices you will be able to see the uh, tumor thrombus in the femoral vein, tumor thrombus in the femoral vein. That's the mass, which is moving here to the iliac, then groin, and upper third of femoral. Tumor with the size 18 by 12, 18 by 12 centimeters. Also cuff-like position of the internal external iliac vessels and thrombus in the femoral vein lumen. So we performed surgery. First, partial amputation of penis, then wide incision of the massive conglomerate with lymph nodes, uh, bilateral groin lymph dissection, then there was a very big skin defect and this defect was covered but uh, skin vessel rectal abdominal flap 
and this is the final result. Also, we removed the thrombus, tumor thrombus here from the femoral and iliac vein, and the proximal part was uh, in the ostia of external femoral vein. So this is a uh, penile tumor, and this is conglomerate of lymph nodes. So the results of histologists showed us that this is squamous cell cancer, G3, warty basaloid type, um, tumor embolus in spongios and lymphatic vessels. So lymphovascular perineural invasion, tumor thrombus in the femoral and e external iliac vein. So it had similar similar uh, composition, squamous cell. From 32 removed lymph nodes, metastasis was found in 15, squamous cell metastasis. After a resolution of sepsis and anemia correction, so there was general improvement of uh, patient's echog and functional status. Then we managed to start chemotherapy on day 12 post-op. So the first cycle was day 12. So we gave reduced doses of tisplatinum, day one, then paclitaxel, day one and day eight. Totally, a patient got six cycles of chemotherapy. And after the completion of chemotherapy, we performed control PET CT and we see that lesions in lung without dynamic. So they were not increasing and they are not decreasing and clinically they are not manifesting. So this is the final result seven months later. We have to say that the treatment of such patients requires multidisciplinary approach. This is teamwork. So with uh, ICU, anesthesiologists, plastic surgeons, chemotherapists, and uh, by now, seven months later, patient is active at home, can do some mild physical exercise, no features of continuation of growth, no features of relapse, and uh, no features of progression yet. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think we can start from the questions, and here they are. We will ask our experts, Professor Greenberg and Professor Kutikov, if they have any questions about the case, so they can definitely ask them now and then comments. Please. Did you talk about uh, pre-surgical chemo, neoadjuvant? Well, patient's conditions was poor enough, very poor functional status uh, pre-surgically because patient was actually in septic shock, in septic shock with hemoglobin four with lactoacidosis and septic condition, no, no issue. The question was to remove the massive bleeding lesion, a septic lesion, which was actually life-threatening in this case. Yes, Leah. Yes, in America, we never see that. Why don't we see that? Well, because mainly the population had uh, circumcision in childhood. So boys normally go through circumcision. So almost all the boys, majority of them, 70-80%, um, they go through that. So even in our cancer clinic, so we see different cancers. It's less than 10%, 10 patients, sorry, 10 patients with penile cancers a year, 10 cases a year. But, you know, stage four, well, well, I never saw that. I never saw that in my life, circumcision. Richard, Richard. Uh, we, you know, I have uh, seen one or two cases. When I trained uh, 40 years ago when I started, you know, if you had disease in the uh, pelvic lymph nodes, uh, there was no treatment. And these patients uh, just progressed and they passed away from this uh, very advanced cancer. Most of the people that I've seen with advanced cancers are patients who are Hispanic, who came from 
the subtropical areas like Puerto Rico, uh, areas where uh, circumcision was not performed very often. Uh, and uh, I remember my first patient was somebody who was 37 years old, who we had to do a, a partial penectomy and bilateral groin dissections, and fortunately did very well. But we had no systemic management. We had to be uh, surgically aggressive. Uh, and, uh, you know, the treatment, the training I had with penile cancer is you always wanted to go one, one area beyond where you knew there was cancer. But again, uh, I'm old and I, I trained before they had ultrasound and CAT scans and PET scans and uh, uh, everything was done much more clinically based. And uh, we did have, we were able to do IVPs. Uh, you probably never saw an IVP in your life, but uh, <laughs> we did IVPs and that's how we, we came up with nephrotomograms and tried to make these assessments, but we explored patients, et cetera. Uh, nowadays, I think there is some uh, uh, use of uh, systemic uh, immunotherapy for squamous cell carcinoma in general. Uh, there are a couple studies in the United States. Um, most of the people being, uh, uh, you know, in uh, started on these protocols and they're all done on protocol for immunotherapy are coming out of MD Anderson in Texas because uh, they're close to obviously to the Mexican border and there's a lot more people uh, coming up uh, from the uh, South America and Central America area. University of Florida uh, is also a place where uh, a large number of these uh, patients are put, being put on protocols. But, you know, I think there are several protocols looking at squamous cell carcinoma in general, which have shown some efficacy using uh, uh, nilop uh, nilotamab and uh, hepalumumab uh, in combination. Uh, I think uh, uh, we would treat these patients, uh, and I'm, you know, we don't treat these patients as urologic oncologists. These would be treated through the, our, you know, with our medical oncology colleagues. But uh, I think uh, what we, uh, you know, I think there is some efficacy using uh, some of these combined uh, or combination immunological IL-2 type of uh, uh, treatments uh, for squamous cell in general. And I would expect that penile squamous cell carcinoma should behave uh, very similarly. Uh, I don't know what else I can tell you referable to uh, that since we don't have a lot of personal experience, which I have to be honest with you, I'm very happy about. Uh, this is not an opera. I, I like to do big surgery, but this is not one of those that I would uh, sign up uh, and say, please, can I do this one? I think you did a great job in both these cases. I think, uh, you know, the first thing that uh, comes to mind is it's better to be lucky than good. That's an American, uh, co you know, uh, analogy. Uh, sometimes uh, being in the right place, I think the second patient is very lucky to be alive. Uh, and uh, I think it, it, it bodes well for the uh, basic Russian stamina. Uh, that uh, they could tolerate uh, septic shock and a hemoglobin uh, under five and have major surgery and survive. It also tells me that uh, as something I've always known is that, uh, you know, uh, you guys do excellent surgical uh, care for your patients. And, uh, and uh, but I, I would guess that if you took the next three or four patients like this and they wouldn't have the same excellent outcome, unfortunately. That's all I have to say. Alex? Yeah, Alex. We have to, you know, we don't see these advanced cases here, but when we do, there is a lot of enthusiasm. And, you know, um, so I'll tell you what, what the clinical questions are here. I mean, the clinical questions are here. You know, there's this impact trial uh, that's um, uh, Dr. Petaway from MD Anderson uh, sort of initiated and uh, Phil Spies at uh, Moffitt, they're, they're kind of the, uh, is, you know, they're spearheading this. Um, and we have it open here. And I think we have it open. We've been having it open for six months. So I don't think we've enrolled anybody because we don't have these patients. But, um, and, you know, just to, to, just to sort of speak to the fact that you're inviting us as experts, but you guys are the experts in this space. I, I mean, this is, I think the expertise that you guys have in this, I, I think, are unmatched. Uh, just, I mean, in the States, there is just not this expertise here because we just don't see this disease. 
Uh, but the trial that we have opened, and this is an international trial, I think, in, 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 in I don't know if it's open in, in Russia, but it's, and in, I know in Western Europe, uh, there are some uh, centers. It basically is uh, for patients who present with inguinal, uh, you know, with, with uh, N, N1 and N2 disease. And to, it, gets, it gets randomized to surgery directly, gets randomized to chemotherapy, and which is, you know, I see you guys are not using ifosfamide. Maybe that's a point of discussion that, you know, here are the guidelines, and Richard sits on the NCCN guidelines for penile cancer. It's, you know, it's, we call it TIP. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, paclitaxel, taxol, uh, ifosfamide, and cisplatin, platinum. So um, I, I didn't see you guys using ifosfamide. I'm just curious why, why, why they're, you know, uh, if that's just not not the not the course of action there, but um, you know, so in this trial, you randomize directly to surgery, uh, tip chemotherapy versus and then surgery versus tip chemotherapy radiation and then surgery, and then um, and then there's another randomization if um, uh, if there is. Um, Depend on risk stratification at your lymph node dissection, you get randomized to pelvic lymph node dissection versus no pelvic lymph node dissection. I mean, that's the big debate here, whether to do a pelvic lymph node dissection at all. A patient like this, you know, I'll be honest, a patient like the second patient comes into a cancer center at the United States. Um, I think there's going to be very little enthusiasm to operate for right or wrong reasons. That's just the culture here now. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I, these penile cases come on so infrequently that when I have, especially the young patients, when I have penile cases, I usually email a few key opinion leaders like Phil Spies and Petaway. And, you know, they I had a 40 year old, you know, a couple of years ago where it basically had some invasion in peripubic space from the, from the penectomy. And there was, you know, an email exchange to walk away from that patient. I mean, and that's a very resectable lesion. Um, and I mean, you know, in my experience, they just do so poorly. It's such a terrible disease. Um, you know, you, you put them through so much at the end of their life and then they, they succumb rather rapidly. But, you know, like, like the first patient, uh, you know, I, 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 I do have, you know, a couple of survivors in my clinic where all of a sudden you'd expect them to not be here in six months and, you know, five, six years go by and they're still here. So I think there are exceptions. I think we, especially the young patients, we owe, we owe them to, to try to do what we can. Спасибо большое за uh, ваше мнение, ваши комментарии. Thank you very much for your position, for your comments. Uh, я хочу сказать, что I would like to say, к сожалению, мы unfortunately, сейчас uh, референсным центром для таких пациентов. We are the reference center for such patients in Russia. Одного больного каждую неделю. And I have one case each week. One case yeah. like this each week. Это не самый плохой случай. And this is not the worst case, believe me. That's not the worst. Просто uh, остальные случаи страшно показывать. The other cases, I'm terrified to show. I don't want to scare you. Uh, потому что uh, они Because требовали во многих случаях бедренных сосудов. In many cases, ligation of the femoral vessels. Как осложнение иногда приходилось пациентам ампутировать нижние конечности. Sometimes we had to make amputations of the lower limbs because of the complications. Uh, и uh, в этой связи у меня... And Вопрос, как That is why we have a question to everyone. Существуют разные подходы. Because there are different approaches. При необходимости протезирования бедренных. If we need to graft. Есть femoral vessels. То, что называется extra anatomical. So there are so-called extra anatomical. Grafting. Grafting. Протез не проходил в зоне инфицированной. So not let it go in the infectious area. И uh, неплохие результаты And, well, not bad results, публикуются некоторыми авторами, которые анатомикал протезирование. Uh, мы в своей практике применяем uh, обычное протезирование, using standard grafting. Uh, не без осложнений, Definitely with complications, но тем with не менее с uh, довольно успешными исходами в конечном Quite successful outcomes, after all. Поэтому вот вопрос, so, я не знаю, может быть, know, с учетом того, что у вас действительно мало этих... In mind that maybe you don't have many of such cases. 
сложно будет вам ответить, но so probably it will be difficult for you to answer, but какой подход применяют синтетизирование extra anatomical do you mainly use extra anatomical or something else if you need grafting? This experience. I mean, this is just not, not. We don't see, you know, to replace iliac veins and arteries for penile cancer is just not something that happens here. I mean, we just don't. They don't present at this late stage either. Even when they come in, they, you know, they just don't see it. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, we just don't see these cases. Richard, I think I think you know some of it has to do with the fact that. Uh, as Alex points out, uh, we're seeing these patients at a much earlier stage in their disease, whether that's because of the system here in the United States where there's a lot more, um, uh, you know, uh, family practice, general medicine on a routine basis, uh, whether these lesions are just picked up or sooner. Uh, I think there's a, a little bit more uh, education uh, to be concerned about something that's growing on your penis that may not be the case in rural uh, Russia, where you're probably seeing the vast majority of these patients coming from with this kind of advanced disease. It's, you know, just the odor coming from the carotid tumor uh, coming out of growing out of the iliac would be something that would, you know, attract an, an awful lot of attention uh, that I don't see that we get these patients at this stage. I've never seen extracorporeal uh, bypass grafting though. Uh, for an iliac uh, uh, type of lesion of this nature. Uh, I've never seen it again. Uh, that would, you know, uh, you know, I would have to contact the, the vascular people here to see if they've ever done it. But I would guess that the, you know, the, you know, the number of cases that they would be have any experience would be the, you know, you could count on, on the hand, you know, on one hand uh, over a, a lifetime of uh, vascular. I mean, certainly, uh, the vascular surgeons don't like the idea of putting a, a, a an artificial graft in the middle of a, an abscess, uh, you know. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's life. If it's life saving, then you do it and you deal with the consequences down the road. Uh, but I, I don't, uh, as Alex points out, even an old person like me hasn't seen very many of these, and uh, you know, uh, we really uh, were not surgically as aggressive as. Uh, uh, with advanced cases, uh, uh, I think uh, the use of the availability of, of the systemic chemotherapy and now immunotherapy uh, for more advanced disease may get us to a point where we start seeing some of these patients, but most of them die within less than six months uh, if they have metastatic disease and certainly in the patients not responding to first line chemotherapy. I mean, you can try a lot of salvage treatments, but basically they're all going to be dead within six months, no matter what we do. Uh, I think, um, so research, I, I think this is a big opportunity to contribute to the literature. I mean, I don't, I can't, I, I don't know who has this experience. I, I think this, this is, a, my opinion is that this is this experience that you guys have is very, very unique. Um, I think it's, you know, would be a very significant contribution to sort of, you know, describe this and I mean this kind of practice clearly has a role especially in, in these patients who have very few options um, you know I, I, I just I just I don't, I don't know I don't know the literature in this space very well um, in this advanced you know surgery for advanced penile cancer but I, I think that a big contribution can be made as far as reporting experience here what what percentage uh, Sam, what what percentage of patients do you think you know you've presented these two excellent cases? Uh, you know, uh, is this, are these the only two <laughs> or, you know, is this, uh, you know, are you able to save 10% of patients like this that you're seeing since you're seeing a patient a week uh, with this advanced disease? Are we talking 5%, 10%, 50%? I think, because I mean, if you're in the 20% range, this is something that uh, you should put together and, uh, you know, put into the literature. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe this is something that uh, people uh, will, you know, come and see how you do it and uh, learn something and uh, bring it back to their home countries and uh, uh, be much more. I mean, certainly we have very surgically aggressive people. Uh, uh, I, you know, first time I ever met you, which was 20 years ago, you were showing me a video of a large uh, 
vena cava thrombus that you took out. Uh, uh, so, I mean, you guys have always uh, had a, sur a very good surgical acumen and ability and interest. And I think that, uh, you know, there is, a, you know, in this type of cancer, even though this is very, dis you know, psychologically disabling to patients, uh, being willing to do this type of surgery and, uh, and deal with the consequences of it long term, I think are uh, worthwhile if, if indeed we're talking between 10 and 20%. If, you're, if this is the only two patients that you've had that have done well in the last year and you know, out of 50, then I think there, it's more anecdotal. And I think trying to extrapolate this to patients in general or surgeons in general who don't have the expertise and the willingness to uh, you know, have a team together that like you do to, to do these kinds of surgery, is just not going to be very uh, effective or very beneficial. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. So we have two questions in the chat. The first question is, what is the life expectancy of the presented patient? And probably the question to... And the question, second question is about some psychiatry failure, maybe, or psychiatry deficiency in these patients. Well, about life expectancy, I can comment. Please use the microphone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Well, about the first question, about the life expectancy of these patients. Well, at least now, this patient has no data for the progression, speaking about the first case. There is no prolonged growth, no relapse, and um, the patient um, is under the monitoring uh, every three months. So this is closed monitoring, I believe. So we are expecting the results should be at least three years, at least three years. So we have to follow. We will have to influence that surgically, surgically, chemotherapeutically. So we're expecting three years at least. And how many cases we had? We had six cases. Out of six, one died. One died in two and a half months, and the rest are all alive, and they go through rehabilitation. What, what do you do? What would you do if this patient, this patient came in and they were 75 years old and not 45 years old? The high stage of patient who went through surgery and chemotherapy, 70. Top age, 70, 70. Of course, criteria are not yet designed. Criteria of uh, inclusion. Because we need criteria for such patients for treatment because disseminated patients with multiple metastases uh, because we need to know whether it's uh, sensible to do the surgery or if it's a treasure of the vessels that could lead to the disorders in the post-op period from the cardiovascular diseases. Well, I think we had some questions for the discussion. As far as I remember, so once again, could you please show? Could you please show questions about immunotherapy mainly? You already discussed it. I did. I mentioned that, but uh, again, these are uh, very small series. Uh, looking at the, no, uh, you know, you know, most of the penile cancers are uh, uh, are the squamous cell of the penis are combined in. Uh, what they call uh, rare tumors uh, in, uh, in the group presentations and the publications, uh, there are not really a whole lot of directed uh, studies 
other than the, well, the one that Dr. Kudikoff mentioned, uh, which is currently ongoing. But for metastatic, widely metastatic disease, uh, there are these uh, penile cancers are grouped with uh, other uh, squamous cell carcinomas. And as I said, there is some data that shows uh, combination immunotherapy being uh, having some effect on, on these patients. But I, I think this is relatively short term and uh, uh, there's, I don't think, enough specific data on penile cancers in, in the publications that I looked at that would be able to, you know, out of uh, 25 patients, three of them were penile cancers. So it's a little hard for me to uh, comment further on the chemoimmunotherapy protocol. Uh, I think that uh, you, it's interesting that uh, both of the patients you presented with uh, significantly local disease, but also with systemic disease, uh, responded specifically, you know, completely to the chemotherapy. So uh, you don't really need to, you didn't need to uh, investigate the immunological aspects or the immunotherapy aspects of this. Uh, there are some, you know, experimental mouse models I looked, I reviewed, and, you know, they're just such rare cases in the United States. They had to come up with a, uh, a mouse model at MD Anderson to test the immunological options for treatment. Uh, uh, I mean, in terms of, I think uh, the role of cytoreductive uh, uh, nodal dissection uh, with locally advanced disease, uh, and not something that I, I think we do here. Uh, I think uh, we're doing systemic therapy and then if they respond, then considering con consolidation. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, there's a lot of enthusiasm for uh, upfront you know, chemotherapy. Uh, but again, and I answer questions, this uh, impact trial, again, it's sort of an international effort amongst cancer centers trying to figure, you know, figure out the, uh, the sequencing. I mean, the one thing we, you know, we do do is, um, uh, you know, genotyping the tumor. So one of these cases, when, is, when they sort of progress and, you know, inadvertently these days, you throw pembrolizumab at somebody and see if that works. And if that doesn't work, then... Um, you know, we've, uh, you know, the two companies here kind of that dominate are Foundation Medicine and Keras, which, uh, you know, do the genomic sequencing of the tumors. And you see if there is a uh, targetable mutation from, uh, a, 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 you know, another space, uh, a BRAF mutation or something where you can use, you know, melanoma drug for this. And you, you kind of screen the tumor to see if there is a targetable uh, you know, change in, 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 the, in the mutation sequence. So, you know, it's a, that's a, you know, what, 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 uh, what American football, they call it a Hail Mary, you know, you just throw it up and see if it lands. Um, but, you know, that's something that we do it kind of in the, in the last phases of somebody's life just to try it. Um, but I, I mean, I would, so just to speak to, I think, you know, six cases is a great experience as well. But, you know, there's a mechanism in European urology called surgery in motion where you need 10 cases and then you can have a, um, you can have sort of a video, uh, you know, showcase of, uh, of, uh, of a certain operation. I think this would be really sort of uh, a great mechanism to publicize this, you know, get 10 cases, have follow up for them, especially if, you know, because the, the paradigm now, at least in the West, is to walk away from these cases. And, you know, hearing your experience, maybe that paradigm should be disrupted. Uh, so I, I think reporting this would be a big contribution. The only thing you have to worry about is uh, a lot of uh, other countries sending you these patients. Uh... Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we, we've got uh, uh, quite a lot of these patients, so uh, I don't think we need more. У нас все-таки один вопрос в чате. Алина. We have one question in the chat. Не услышала ответ. Алина didn't get the question, didn't get the answer from the question about the psychiatry history. Maybe there is some psychiatry medical history in these patients. I beg your pardon. What do you think? Have you checked? Well, about the second question, about psychiatry, medical history. As we have very big flow of the patient and we have big turnover of the beds, we do check them. We have psychologists and psychiatrists in trying to catch 
that particular that particular breakage definitely patient is afraid to lose the organ which is very important organ but patient and that's why they don't come they don't come early but you know to let go to such advanced stage definitely there is some psychiatry background behind that that's why yes we try to examine these patients and hopefully we will have the results and as soon as we have enough we will publish it well distinguished colleagues i have to say from the very beginning that dr Halmurzaev is exactly the one who is doing these surgeries and he's our local expert it's not me it's him it's him no, this is teamwork. This is teamwork. So let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. Yes, definitely. Big team, plastic surgeon, chemotherapist. But nevertheless, uh, when he joined our team, when he joined our team, actually, when we start, he started working uh, in this oncology department. Now, half of departments are these patients. Half of departments are penile patients. Well, that's, that's amazing. Thank you very much. That's a unique topic. And uh, I'm sure we will proceed that. And I don't see any more questions in the chat. Well, we have very short tumor boards, normally like this. And our time is almost depleted. So if Richard, Alex, you would like to say some comments, wrapping up words, just a couple of minutes left. Alex, you start. Thank you very much for the invitation. That was really interesting to see, to discuss. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. You know, I learned a lot today. I learned a lot, really. And uh, if you need any help, support and publications, you know, to prepare to, you know, we are ready. We're always ready to help. So I think that's very, that's very interesting. You need to publish. A question. Another question. Yeah, there. In the chat, have you seen secondary malignancies, secondary penile malignancies? Yes, we have this experience when gastric cancer uh, moves metastasis into the penile or prostate uh, metast met uh, gets metastasis into the penile. Yes, there are such cases. Yeah, yeah, we also see that, Alexander said. Fortunately, not often. Mm. Right, right. Well, I believe today we witnessed two interesting cases and we kept the rest of the cases for the other tumor board. And I think sometime later we will show you long-term results about these type of surgeries and hopefully we will have some more data about long-term survival in severe patients with uh, very advanced stages. I would like to thank Richard Greenberg Alexander Kutikov uh, for giving us their time, for finding time and busy schedules to be with us and participated in the discussion of these cases. I do hope that it will become a new, a very good tradition that you will be able to be members of our tumor boards well, with particular rate, maybe once in three months, maybe once in two months, like this, maybe, uh, as, uh, upon your availability. and. All our participants, uh, all our audience from all Russian cities, because today these are not just the Russian colleagues, because we sometimes have international colleagues who are joining our air. So please uh, send us all your cases for further discussions, because we are always happy, always welcome to be part of interesting case discussion. So I would like to thank once again to Sophia Michelson, who is uh, the lead of American Asian Alliance of, on Oncology and they are supporting the, our tumor boards and definitely I would like to thank the uh, Russian Society of Oncologists who is carrying up th them. So many thanks to all of you. Thank you. Stay for, safe. Thank you for allowing us uh, to participate and I hope maybe next year uh, we can uh, meet again in uh, uh, Moscow. And uh, if you get to the States, uh, uh, please let us know so we can get together. Regards to your family. Stay safe. Thank you very much. So, happy Christmas. Happy New Year. And 
pretty sure we'll see each other, not only remotely via Zoom, but also in person. Absolutely. Thank you. Stay safe, have a good day, and goodbye.